Yes, hi. How are you, Simon? I'm good, I'm good. How are you too? Good, good, good. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yes, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have had a good... I'm here. Yeah. I'm here with Chama and Tapa. Hi, Prince Paul. Uh, greetings to you. Welcome. Yes. Well done. You're the first to arrive today. <laughs> <laughs> well <done. Nah>, we, <laughs> we should be the first to enter in. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Mm. How is the UK? It's okay. Okay. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's spring now. Just well, just starting. So we're on the edge. So we had snow last week and then this week it's kind of warm and sunny a bit. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So at least good. at least for us also. Yeah, we at can... least for us also, yeah, we have to Yes. And you've had some yeah. rain there too, I think. Yes, we have also received it for the first time. Okay, good. Yes. Let's hope that keeps coming. So I'm hoping uh, Gerald is going to be here soon. We have a slight challenge in that um, 
we were invited to contribute to a different another meeting at 5:30 so we might have to take a little break but we'll see we'll see how we get on um, okay. yeah one way or another we we, we manage okay uh members members were happy they were happy with the lectures you gave uh, the other time they were putting the tips into practical some of those good practical aspects we have started it mostly on compost manure biogas bio biochar yes now we were only waiting we were only waiting for the uh, vetiver from 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 this lady who yes yes i think caroline she said uh, she had vetiver and we know we have some at butambala ali t uh, has some um and i'm going to mention in the talk um our friend andrew kalema who is talent agroforestry and and uh deborah has been to visit him so we know we can get plants from him too oh yeah uh well yeah it's a matter of transport and all of that but but it yeah it's that it's there yeah okay um, so that is, that is what, yes that is what members were telling me to tell you and they were like yeah, one moment you should visit them again yes i would very <laughs> much i'd very much like to do that okay i'm going to start recording yeah. Yeah um yes i don't know when we'll be able to visit next time but i i will be looking forward to it it was a year ago now since um i was last there this time last year i was with with deborah and tapa yes, did yes, i see you when i came did you see me yes we really need to see you yes uh, and give uh, us tips and guidelines on those other aspects that you have touched on mm. uh, and the support that you have rendered to us. Uh, we are expecting you to give us <laughs> certificate. <laughs> mm. Well, I'm going to uh, yeah. challenge you. I'm going to begin to challenge you now because this is a uh, greetings, Caroline. Um, this is just, this is, this is actually the halfway point um this week we're number 12 of 24 so things are going to change slightly and i'll be um looking to you guys as well to be using these ideas in your con in the context of where you're at so that's going to be really interesting and um clearly we want more than ideas we want actions it's about permaculture is a design practice so it's about how we actually make things happen and that's what we're here to do uh, yes. wait, okay and that, and that is already in our tips we have we have put it into practical we are not only theoretical but practically we are very active on it it's great uh, to, great to know simon and and i know that yeah i mean every is um it's 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 exciting to me to see people take these ideas and apply them and it's you always learn something new because every circumstance is slightly different so you know the way that we want to invite you to be part of this uh, academy of permaculture is it's a two-way conversation and an ongoing conversation and as you gain experience you can become a teacher you can become a mentor a supporter and inspiration to other people so that's also how this works and i mean caroline as well i see you nodding and you've been through that you've experienced that yourself i know that you did some you, you did studied with paul and now you've come to us and yeah it, it's an ongoing process and that's how i want us to think about it and i'm learning too you know i'm not the fountain of all knowledge i'm just a, a teacher you know my, my ability is to, to pass on things and make ideas accessible because uh, mm -hmm. i keep saying the real world's really complicated <laughs> but we have to find our way through that you know which means we have to be able to make decisions and and, and sort out yeah anyway i get ahead of myself um okay. i i did this um here we go 
Yes. Um, just as a few opening thoughts to get us going. Oh, someone's there. Oh, lost it. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm just, I'm having to do the the room as well. Okay, uh, Stella is arriving. Greetings to you, Stella, and welcome. So these are my opening thoughts. We'll have a, we'll stop again and have a have a chat when a few more people arrive. Um, so there's a couple of different themes that I want to uh, look at this week, and the first thing is within. Holmgren's principle six, which is the idea that produce no waste, waste not, want not. And actually within that is this idea that when, what the lesson that we get from nature is everything cycles. There isn't actually an end to things. Um, energy and matter sort of translate in, 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 into different forms and um, living matter becomes dead matter becomes living matter again. So we, 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 we're really encouraged to see that and then begin to understand that okay so as permaculture designers what you're going to be doing is creating designing understanding working with cyclical systems you need to take this idea everything cycles right into your heart because that's the if you like that's the dynamic the thing that drives nature it's it's this it's the completing of the cycles and as designers we want to age that process we want to speed it up we want to make it more efficient and in doing so realize that we will never run out of resources in nature things are abundant as long as we can if you like work with the processes okay so this is a key key idea um I was just looking on the internet just now and I saw as an advert for a course, nine weeks course uh, for five or six hours of your time each week, um, $2,400. So I just want you to realize what great value you're getting here on my permaculture course. Um, I don't know much about this course. This is a professional course for people wanting to understand the circular economy, the transition for future sustainability. This is a training course aimed at business managers and middle management people, people decision makers, perhaps, about how to make their businesses in tune with the idea of a circular economy, understanding everything cycles. Well, we've been teaching this for decades in permaculture. It's nothing new and you don't need $2,400. But it's interesting to think, see these ideas really permeating into the sort of professional sphere. And I'm saying about time too as well, because uh, we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, I love this statement, Greta Thunberg, I think she's just turned 20 and, and she's a remarkable person who has created waves around the world. And as a 14 year old child, in her mind, the logic of governments saying they were concerned about climate and climate change, but continuing to invest in coal, gas and oil did not make sense. And she said, well, you're sending me to school to learn, but clearly the adults are not listening to the scientists. Why should I listen to my teachers if you're not prepared to listen to your scientists? It's a kind of a circular argument. She says, we want the change. We demand the change. We are the change. And I think that's really interesting. Instead of putting it outside of herself to saying, you know, come and help me, rescue me. We want there to be change. We demand there's change. The realization that actually for that to create change, it has to come from you, from your behavior, from your understanding. You know, and this, this idea of permaculture ethics, really thinking about how we meet our needs, our relationships with society, our relationship to the natural world. Everything is kind of connected. She also said, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So stop hoping, start acting. 
Um, focus on achievable goals, achieve them, then evaluate that achievement and figure out what you're going to do next based on that experience. That's the permaculture design process. I want you to bring you into that mindset. Ultimately, you are the change. The world, to make the world to be how you want it to be, how it can help meet your needs, meet your community's needs, you've got to take some responsibility for that. The, des this, the permaculture design process puts you at the wheel. You're at the, the heart of things. So thinking about everything cycles, how one thing not f follows on to another. Um, Greta Thunberg, she's a, a, a from Sweden. Uh, she started protesting at 14. She's now 20. She's set up the Greta Thunberg Foundation. She's practically a world leader. She speaks with such authority and for so many people. And if you don't necessarily feel she speaks for you, I can tell you she speaks for the youth. And there are so many, especially young girls, but also, you know, everybody really inspired by those ideas. And I'll tell you, that's what it takes to create change. No matter what scale you're trying to do it on, um, it takes that sense of responsibility and the sense of putting your energy out there with intent. So I'm going to name, name check uh, our sister, Laura Muenguzi, who um, is a youth climate activist. Uh, she represented Uganda at the, uh, as it, was it COP27 this year in Kinshasa um, as a part of the youth climate dedication. You know, she's creating ripples in her community. She, she's inspiring the other uh, uh, young people around her and she's inspiring. She should be uh, challenging and inspiring us as adults to be leaders. Okay. <clears throat> Cyclical economies, energy, um, uh, uh, resource from waste, produce no waste. This is my theme, part of our theme. Um, this is our visit to Talent Agroforestry Center. It's, it's in an it's a little bit north of, of Kampala. And the gentleman in the blue t shirt is name is Andrew Kalema. Um, he used to be a journalist <laughs> and um, he's moved into agroforestry and he's actually Uganda's link bamboo expert. And um, one of the things that he does at his place is propagates different kinds of bamboo plants, makes them available to other people. He said he, he can't propagate them fast enough. The demand is, you know, is, is huge. So um as he c propagates his bamboo plants it creates quite a lot of waste the trimmings from the you know from the bamboo and had lots of bits left over so yeah for sure he's making things like bee beehives and furniture lots of crazy uh, wonderful creative things from bamboo offcuts but he also has a lot of kind of waste material left and I like this idea of a kind of cyclical economy thinking is, okay, so here's uh, some of our team members as Clovis, uh, Zainab, Nandi, and um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, what's the name she's got? I know the name. Uh, ah, I feel terrible now, I've forgotten the name. Um, here we are at um, Andrew's place. And he's telling us what he's doing. And uh, Nandy's taking some notes in her book, Catch and Store Energy. Um, and this having a good look. And what we're looking at this, this is the potting mixture that Andrew uses for the plants that he's propagating. Kazora Enoch. Sorry, Enoch, I forgot your name. Uh, not that you have a far from my thoughts, but yes, sorry. Um, um, and look, this, a little bit hard to see the picture, this is a brick kiln, this is a brick box that Andrew's made, and you can see it's all burned inside. And what he does is, out of all of his waste bamboo offcuts, and when it's full, he covers the top with iron sheets and piles soil on top. He fires the kiln, obviously there's air holes in it, he could 
control the burn, it turns the bamboo into biochar, which he crushes into a powder. And now the soil that he piled on top of the iron sheets on the top, okay, that helped seal the, um, the kiln. Um, but also now that soil has been cooked and it's sterilized. So what he does is he knows he can't be sending out plants to customers, to other places um, in soil that might carry disease. So what he does is he keeps goats, he collects the manure from the goats, he composts that manure, he composts that with the biochar, and then mixes that with the soil that's been sterilized. So now he knows he's got a bioinoculated, really healthy soil that he's sending his plants out in. So see how he's using the waste products of one system to actually drive the system. <laughs> it, it's, it's smart. And he's propagating plants and he's making those available to other people. And um, yeah, talent agroforestry, no waste system, really inspiring. Um, I've been, we've been chatting this week uh, at a test Fahun, our, our, our brother in Ethiopia. He has also been following this course, not live, but he's been downloading. Um, and he's currently in, um, in Lalibela, uh, attending the first Syntropic, I think, agroforestry course to be held, I think the second in Ethiopia, first in Lalibela. And he's really excited about that. Um, and Syntropic agroforestry is kind of permaculture. It means modeling from nature to grow very resource efficient uh, uh, food, forage, and uh, cash crop systems. We look forward to hearing back from Tess Fahun. And his picture of that he sent me last week of them making the compost tea. We've been talking about compost tea. I'm going to be making some on the farm. And here they are making their own, applying those ideas that he learned one week to the farm in the next. So the same as what you were telling me, Simon, you're applying these ideas as you go forward. And that's, I really welcome that. Um, yeah, some daffodils. I just had some picture of some daffodils. This is the, uh, the, this flower is a symbol of Wales, of the Cymru, of the country where I am, and of St. David, the patron saint of Cymru. And, and it also represents spring. So it's that we, when we see the yellows of daffodils, we know that winter is receding and the days are getting longer. So that's a nice time, nice thing to think about. And just my final thought, I think, oh, a couple of, couple of final thoughts was produce no waste, cyclical systems, a reminder that the icon uh, for that, that um, principle is the earthworm. And here's a quote from... Uh, from Jeff Lawton, it's not the soil itself, it's the soil life that is the most important element. And here's our soil food web diagram that we've referred to a few times and reminded that this, this cyclical systems is this, this zero waste systems is, and if we can understand that, then that's, that's actually the core understanding that drives our ability to meet our needs sustainably and in a regenerative way. Okay. Grow food, develop complex ecosystems that provide the food, the medicines, the resources that we need in a way in which we can build ever more complex ecosystems. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're learning about. And the final slide here is of um, a sort of spider diagram of a cyclical way of thinking that we use as a tool in design in permaculture. So I'm going to um, introduce this idea to you today and um, I'm going to give you a design model to follow just to now begin to start thinking about how you are going to use permaculture to transform yourself, your home, your community and to inspire and send out a message to the rest of the world so that we can make this change that we know we need to make. Um, we, we, we don't need, we need to have 
actions. And to have actions, we need a plan, and then we deliver on that plan. But it's a circular plan as we test. Oh, did that create the result that we wanted? Do we need to make changes? Um, here's the thing about permaculture is we go, we start small and slow, and we, we progress slowly, slowly in a way in which we can build on itself. So um, there's our opening thoughts. Okay, there's a couple of messages on signal if you're able to reach that uh stella um at about half past five the arquiton trust meeting and we're hoping for some input from us um but anyway let's let's what we'll do is i will uh begin the next presentation and the main presentation and um we will um if someone can try and stop me at half past five so i'll give this about 35 40 minutes and um i'm going to tell a story and i'm going to um talk about the evolution of a real project here in in the uk um also i'm trying to you know the two the co-creators of permaculture are, are bill mollison and david holmgren and David's principles prov provide a lovely frame for the course. So I, I like to follow with principle six. Um, but I also like to make sure I don't miss that because this is the book that really this course is built on. And it's this incredible piece of work by Bill Mollison. And I've also tried to think about what it says in each of the chapters as we reach it. And chapter 12 is uh, a good chunk. Here it is, chapter 12. A uh, good few pages there. And in, in, in the recent chapters, he's been looking at the different climate zones. And the climate zone for chapter 12 is humid, cool to cold climates. So these kind of this is the UK kind of climate. And you're going to see examples of uh, farming and gardening systems in a humid, cool to cold climate. We're in a cool, humid, cool climate. To be honest, it's a pretty benign, um, you know, not too, it's quite a friendly system to grow in, actually, our climate uh, that, that we have here, the temperate climate. And, and it, it frustrates us all the time because it's too cold and it's too wet and we can't quite finish things off. The seasons are a bit short, um, gets a bit too wet sometimes. Um, but actually, um, all things considered, things grow quite slowly and it, it's manageable, you know, um, and, um, uh, and so we can do, we're, we're surprising how much we can do. Okay, I found it. So, um, <clears throat> Cum Harry. Cum is the Welsh word for a little valley. And usually at the top end of a valley as well. And Harry is a name. And <clears throat> many years ago, um, a, a chap called Richard Northridge, actually, and he had studied permaculture, um, started a small market garden growing vegetables up here in the in the Welsh hills and he, he 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 was you know trying to learn I guess through the experience and enjoying producing vegetables it was a good you know good thing to do and but what he quickly learned was quickly realized was here in Wales we have very poor you know quite no quite poor soils are quite thin and we have a lot of rain, which washes through the nutrients, especially the sort of the nitrogen, the sort of energy giving parts of the plants. 
So in, in, from his experience of growing vegetables in a cool, temperate climate was he needed to build a much better soil. And he thought about how, 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 how he might go about that and asked himself the question, what would be the most sort of available resource that he could use to make, you know, to improve his soils, basically to make compost. And um, to cut a long story short, what Richard uh, quickly learned was um, the most available um, a resource for making uh, compost was food waste. Here in the West, we have refuse collection. We have big trucks drive around towns once a week, and we put all of our trash, our waste in black bags, and they take it away. And we never have to think about it. And it goes in a hole in the ground somewhere. And slowly, slowly over the years, people start to realize it's really expensive. It's a huge environmental cost. And actually, a lot of what we're throwing away isn't waste, especially not food waste. And then the other thing, that of course, we realized was that was realized is if you separate out food waste from the other trash, the other trash doesn't then smell of rotten food. And, and, and it's much easier then to separate it out and find uses, recycle the plastics uh, and the metals and the glass. And, and maybe compost the paper and card and, you know, so forth. Um, so the beginning of eliminating waste was not to mix it all together and to begin to look at eat those components that's, that, that we were thinking of as waste and ask ourselves, can we find a higher value use for it? And if so, how? And can we incorporate that into a system that is productive? So... I have to, quite a long story this, but going back to this is what we're looking at here is an overhead uh, aerial shot of a standard industrial unit. You've probably all seen them. It's a metal box with a roof and um, companies rent them out and they you know do their light, light industry in it. So let's just have a look at this is a standard unit built by the Welsh Development Agency in the 1970s. And Kum Harry took this on. Well, I first went there in 2010, so let's say the early 2000s. And um, and you can see there's a bit of this. So this is actually a railway line there. There's a line of trees, like a hedge, and there'd be a drainage ditch there next to the railway. And then there's some trees which are actually on the land. And this is where people they used to park trucks. And you can see it is bare earth, but all the topsoil has been scraped off, and it's just you know the hard clay under uh, you know subsoil that um has been driven on for years and very compacted so what um richard northridge learned was for his veg growing project to be successful he needed to find um uh, nutrients to make compost the, the available nutrients the really available nutrients was food waste but there's a problem is that if you start composting lots of food waste, it becomes a biohazard. You have to be in, in a very regulated environment. You have to think about diseases and pathogens and smells and flies. And it, it, it gets complicated quickly. Their idea was to set up a controlled environment inside this big metal shed that they could do aerobic composting in they could make the kind of compost that we want as gardeners and they could make it all from the waste that was already actually the, the, the local county the local councils were already paying money to move this cart this what this food waste around so now they had somewhere to take it to and one of the, what we did was um the organization did was they pioneered a system where people put their food waste in a special container and that is picked up once a week and now because there isn't food waste it's especially cooked food and there's a you'd be amazed how much of it there is in the waste stream and you know out of date things that have, oh, you know anyway um 
so this was this was this was the state of the organization <clears throat> and here's, here's one of their posters from uh, about 2006. This is the beginning of uh, trying to educate the public because this was new. This was creating change. It's a change that might create hope, a change that might create other actions. But this was the beginning of trying to educate the population. The town was called Newtown in, in, in Paris and here in Wales. And saying, challenging people, food waste. You can let us compost your food waste or you can send it to the landfill. The decision's in your hands. Um, so put it in the right bin. Educating and, and, and planting seeds of new ideas into population. I'll say it's about 2006. Um, here is, let's say, about 2010. This is their food waste, their, the composting plant. I think I might have showed you the slide already. But uh, the food waste is here and up to the, the whole the whole area is controlled the public can't go in here this is special collection and things are delivered in kind of you know containers and 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 you know it's a controlled process so the food waste is actually put inside biodegradable plastic bags so you can make pla you can make plastic you can make plastic out of anything actually out of anything but anything starchy and um so you can actually make a bag that will biodegrade will compost over time and this is what they use for collecting food waste and um what was important is food waste is very high in nitrogen to make compost you need to balance that with high carbon content and the carbon that was available in for composting um is is narrow diameter wood. It's trees, it's shrubs and uh, uh, hedges, and where they cut trees along power lines. There's a lot of that kind of material. So all of that gets shredded up in this green thing. Um, so it all becomes small particles mixed with the food waste, composted in a special bay, temperature monitored, make sure we've killed the pathogens. And then the compost is moved to the other side of the factory where it's finished. We'll step back from all of that detail because that's not what this story is about. But in this photo here that you see was I was invited to visit the factory in 2010. So 13 years ago now. And here's me doing my site visit. I'm doing my first visit to the site. And I'm thinking, what is here? What opportunities that might be there? They want, they'd asked me to come and look at the factory to talk to them about maybe possibilities, actually what they could do with all this compost that they were making, because their first objective was to remove it from the waste stream. They hadn't, they weren't specialists in growing or farming or anything like that. They were more in the waste management industry. So this was where two different worlds came together. The people who collected the waste and the people who actually wanted to use it. So that's an interesting um, uh, coming together as well. Hello, Gerald. Um, so this is the, there's that factory. There's that big metal box building that I said. Inside of there is all of the composting going on. And this is that land, piece of land that I'd said, the soil had been scraped off and it was hammered really hard. This was the bit of land that the people at the factory had said to us, can we build a garden here? And someone had tried and they hadn't succeeded. And that's because there wasn't really any soil. And, 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 you know, you're starting from such a, a difficult place that they were kind of, they were failing a bit. Um, but what we, what we thought, what we saw, what I saw was, some of the key infrastructure needed is there, like this uh, polytunnel. Um, and even though there's no soil here, or there's, the soil is terrible, what we have is a very large building. And that very large building could be used to collect a lot of rainwater. And if we had a tank that we could store the rainwater in that was slightly higher than the garden, 
then we could gravity feed water anywhere we wanted. And because the building's so big, we can, you know, we can store as much, you know, we can, we're going to catch more water than we can store. So unlimited supply of water above the garden. That's priceless. The second thing we had was an unlimited supply of compost. Well, if we got compost and we got water, we can make soil. And we were absolutely confident of that. And um, so that was my first, my opening thoughts. Um, I also noticed, though, that um, you might just notice that there's some uh, something going on here on the left. And when I asked, I found out that there was somebody who was actually coming to the um, to this location every Tuesday, um, teaching uh, to have people how to start gardening. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And look, here's here's the beds that uh, the teacher had made. Her name is Emma. And um, so when I first came to the locker, even despite all this horrible looking damaged soil, uh, somebody's doing some gardening. So the, 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 the um, organization, Kumhari, said to me, OK, Steve, um, what would you do with this space? And I said, I'd turn it into a community garden. And, uh, and and make it somewhere beautiful and abundant that people would want to come to. And they kind of said, yeah, <laughs> kind of laughed a little bit. No, they didn't laugh. They, they said, okay, can you help visualize it? How would you go about? So here's my question to you. You're doing this course. This course is about permaculture design, right? So you're going to take these ideas and you're going to do that to create something. And Whatever you're doing will be unique to you. Your site won't look like this, and you'll have a slightly different climate, and you'll have slightly different resources. But this is the same process that you're going to go through. This is about turning waste into resources. And, and you, I'm asking you, look around. What do you see? I saw a big roof I could catch water on. I saw a building with compost inside it. I thought... Those are the building blocks of building a garden. And if I can set the right things in motion, I, this, this, I see every potential. Um, I don't see this bare, destroyed earth. I see what it could be. I see that potential. Okay. So, um, and look, some basic infrastructure had been put in and there were some raised beds. This was like, this is what had been done so far on the project. But they were kind of felt they were losing. They they didn't have. You can see there's hose pipes everywhere. They were using tap water to water. The problem is you grow things in a polythene house. Is then it doesn't get the rain, so you got to do it. And you know it was a very um, disjointed system, and they wanted to stop. So they were looking for uh, ideas. And again, is opportunities lie in the waste stream. This was like a failed project, and they were looking for ideas. And, you know, I happened to come along. What you're seeing in this picture is it just so happened. This was May 2010. And in May 2010, I had just planned to run a two week residential permaculture design course. And so for our field trip within that course, I brought the student group to Kumhari, to this location. And I said, you're going to be doing a design project as part of your PDC studies. You're going to do a design project, but we're going to turn this car park into a beautiful organic community. Okay, that was the challenge I gave to them. And this is what you're going to learn how to do in the second half of this course. You're going to learn how to design a complex system like this. Okay. First thing you do is you observe. And we made some base maps. We took some measurements and we thought, we said to ourselves, what is there already? We're going to, obviously, anything that we might do in the world on what is there already. So there's our responsibility. Um, so that was our first thing we do is to record everything. And we, from our original observations, we drew some more accurate 
the picture tested that we took the picture and we showed it to the people there and they said you know, have we understood this right is there anything else we didn't understand and another thing we did as a group was we created a vision and this lovely sketch is is like and um, it incorporates things like those two polytunnels that are already there but other elements that weren't there um lots more raised beds we thought about space for people um and maybe a, a low impact structure that might encourage people to come in we thought about paths we thought about access we thought about shade we thought about the the, the, the angle of the sun um and we tried to bring these things into our visualization of what we might do and we showed these pictures to the Kumhari and they said oh we love that okay how would you do that and if we were to give you a budget let's say a certain amount of money two thousand pounds or something like that how would you go about doing that and so that's the next question so that then the these the letters that create your design aren't they is well, where is the place what is it we're trying to achieve? What resources do we have? How long do we have to do it? Th these are the kind of fundamental questions that we ask when we approach design. So one of the things that we thought about, th these are the notes from the students from back then, um, they started thinking about, well, could we could, look, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, ongoing development parts, stages run some little courses could we how would we get a t how would we get other people interested in our project um how would we communicate what we're doing could we run little courses that might draw people's interest we're obviously going to build around the people who are already coming there like that gardening group or any other volunteers that might have had. you know we want to try and get all of that information from the organization so we could weave that into our plan We started to think about the actual sequence of that and what weeks might certain things happen. So we've got a sense of where we wanted to go, a sense of what we wanted to achieve, breaking that down into little steps. Look, somebody drew us a little logo. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we had fun with just art ideas about, again, how we communicate. That was what we had going. That's what we were thinking about. How do we get people interested in what we're doing? So then we... From making a rough map, we started then making one a bit more accurate and recording the the things that were there already. The, and then an element put in, so a path was a very key point. We wanted to create lots of small allotment pot plots for trainee learner gardeners. We wanted to create a space for people. So those things we knew. And we wanted a pond at the, the lowest point of the, of, the, of the garden. And we also knew we were going to capture water at the highest point of the garden. So we thought about where water was going to arrive and where water is going to leave and how we might get the most from it to access. This yellow path links together the main entrance, takes you past the main growing area, plus the polytunnels to the, the, the human people space, the roundhouse. Back past the micro allotments, the learner plots, and, and out again. The first layer of our design took in what was there already, and also our key things that we knew we wanted to add, and, and we thought about the access. These are the staying. And um, we started the training. We started developing uh, uh, sprouting plants, and um, I managed to recruit a friend as a very regular volunteer. Uh, the guy on the right there, his name is Wayne. We hired a machine and we started digging holes in the ground. Um, there's a, a youth, a young guy who was there for work experience. And um, what we're doing there is we're digging post holes. And we'd had this idea. There was a little bit of budget, so we did ha have some money but that um, we wanted to build something that was striking. And actually the train line went behind, went past here. So we actually thought, oh gosh, people on the train will see what we're doing here. If, if we make something that looks different, that has a different you know, vibe to it, um, 
Let us get people talking. We want people to be interested in our garden. Let's make something beautiful. Let's make it interesting. And um, we're not randomly placing it, right? It very carefully in advance. How are we going to place the structure? So the people enter from here and are kind of attracted by the, the eye, follows you right across the garden, gives you a hello, and encourages visitors to come and en enter and, 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 you know, and, and, and experience the garden. One of the reasons we chose to build this roundhouse from wood is that actually, we were on a date, and our neighbor, or near, nearby, uh, was a very big sawmill. And they processed, you know, hundreds of tons of wood there. And we could get wood waste, like this wood chip, uh, these off cuts and things, or almost these, these tim big timbers we had to pay for. Um, but uh, all in all, it was a, a good investment of our money. And we assembled those components into an interesting that gave a, a focus for volunteers, a chance for people to come and learn and work together, experience new things, build something that was striking and beautiful, and in the process, learn skills, meet new people. Um, just for example, the guy in this photo, he was completely new to permaculture. He'd been a postman and he'd built computers and he was unemployed and he was looking for a new direction. And I said, come and, um, you know, come and see what we're doing here. And, and here he is, you know, sort of greenwood carpentry. Um, look, you can see all these lovely little plots now that are forming and look at our, our path that we, we'd planned. See how these elements are coming together now and allowing our project, our, you know, to, to, to happen. Um, here's people working on the, on the, on the structure. And, you know, into the second year of this project, already our car park was this is soft, inviting, organic living space. All we did was we just kept to our principles, minimum tillage, keep the soil covered. Um, we use these uh, agricultural um, fabrics because we, we had them, um, but lots of other things we only had a few but we just moved them around a lot and um we had access to certain tools um but we only needed them when we were building the garden and as as the process is on we started to make long-term friends some of the volunteers that were coming and picking the food we realized they needed it you know there were times of the year when they were you know, finding food expensive and especially fresh stuff and and um you can see the more attractive the garden became and the more we began to layer in details and put in little fences and things here what we found was we've got a broader range of people volunteers coming people the nicer the garden looked the more people might want to stay and become involved oh some people this experience was life-changing um that it's, it's very easy for people to become socially excluded or socially isolated. Maybe they've had some illness or some addiction problems or depression or coming back from, you know, from, from childcare or something like that. And people lose their confidence and they lose their, you know, people are part of the waste stream. And part of that question is how do we reach out and connect with those people who are not engaged? Because they're also resources. So, some of our volunteers, there's my colleague Emma in the middle, two volunteers are having actually transformational experiences themselves just by being part of something that's, you know, that's new and that's, that's, that's interesting and, 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 and so forth. Um, so um, in, in, in 2011, uh, something happened which kind of ha changed my life and um, has impacted, impacted on all of us, really, is these guys came to visit. 
and this is um, the uh, Basoga team of um, uh, uh, Dolanthermio, which is Welsh for Farmers Link. And this is an active link between people here in Wales and, and people in eastern Uganda. And there's uh, these six guys came over on a study visit for a couple of weeks. And I was invited to show them around or for part of to host some of their visits. Here they are visiting us at Kumhari. And I'm having a conversation there with Moses Kitembo, the guy there with the white hat. And he told me some years later that seeing that garden and understanding that we'd done all of that with no fertilizer, with just the compost from the factory, made him realize in his head for the first time that, of course, organic systems are better. He had an aha moment at that point. And um, this was the beginning of a friendship. Um, meeting in 2011, um, I was invited to go to Uganda in 2014 uh, to go and visit them in return. And, in, and, then, and then in that process, I had the idea to maybe go back, which was 2016, to teach, to see how teaching this permaculture course would resonate with people there. So all of these connections are coming around the idea of closing the waste stream, of, of creating, you know, inclusive systems that eliminate waste. Uh, seed saving, seed saving is a tool. Uh, we, could, we need to talk more about that as a topic. Um, sharing of knowledge. What we realized was that as soon as you have a, an, a community garden like this, and if you're doing things in a slightly, you know, experimental way or interesting way, is people want to come and see it. So it becomes your demonstration and training center. And here is, a, a, again, another PDC group visiting the garden um, all those years ago. Uh, and here's some of our produce. You know, this is year two of growing food in a car park. And that's, those are our cabbages. Uh, you know, I rest my case. Uh, pumpkins, we had to go all sorts, um, amaranth, uh, dodo, which we grew for seed. Um, um, you can see now the garden is it's much more established. You can see how it was starting to come together. These are some of our volunteers doing our very first biochar experiment. So now I'm reminded that it's 12 years since we started experimenting with biochar. Um, and a lot more to say on that subject. Um, we grow ochre that year and um, some of our happy garden volunteers. And there's our garden look two years in. There was, that was that dead, you know, uh, uh, dead soil sort of car park. When we first went there, every time it rained, the whole garden would just be a sheet of water uh, flowing. And they tried to drain, dr to, to make ditches down the middle of the garden to drain the water. And what we said was, well, clearly your soil isn't porous. Um, as soon as you add compost and open up that soil, um, when it rains now, the garden holds and receives that rainfall. So making use of waste, holding in the system, building yields. Look, look at the strategic placement of elements now from what was that car park. We've got a very carefully placed, we've got our circular path, we've got our intensive little training beds, there's our tool shed, there's our um, uh, intensive growing space, there's our compost still coming in, and so forth. Anyway, on it goes. It was such an adventure. We talked about propagating plants and passing them on. People started to use our little um, low impact building as a training space and uh, Yeah, so there's the story of, of Kumhari part one. And I'll, um, you know, just, just think about that as a process, how design was a process. Look, we began with nothing, but we saw the potential. We asked ourselves, what resources have we got? What is it, what's energies are flowing through this space? We discovered that mm, we can harvest a lot of water. 
we discovered that there's compost. We discovered that we could build human relationships and connections. And through that, we build a vision. We can communicate that vision using permaculture design to create visualizations step by step to actually create the, you know, follow through on our vision using locally resourced materials. Look, if you don't have wood, don't build out of wood. You build up what you have. What we found was we went and looked and we saw what was available and, and we used that to set us on our way. Okay, so so you might go, well, there's a happy story with a happy ending. Lovely, lovely, and it was lovely. But of course, the next thing that happened was, oh, here's it all coming to life. Look, um, uh, working with our volunteers, the, the frog pond full of frog spawn, um, our polytunnel full of you know lovely plants, and a senior volunteer there. Um, we started doing our seed saving, um, got reaching out into the town, into the community, offering seed swaps and giveaways. Um, we took over an old shop for for a week to to to, to do you know to, again to connect with the community, um, and then Kum Harry lost the contract to make the compost, and the factory shut down, and we were told to get rid of our garden, and it all had to, to go back to being a car park, and we cried. It was awful. It was heartbreaking. Um, so that's us. That's pretty much as we're trying to dismantle the garden. But it wasn't all bad news. In fact, there was some good news. And we weren't in the best location. Okay. Um, and the output of the first project was we'd learned all of this. We'd learned a lot of lessons. We gained a lot of experience. We had a lot to offer. And we managed to win funding. We managed to use the experience of that garden to go away and get some money from the government, and which gave us a three-year window to create something new. And that process, we, we called it Get Growing, and we had three years. It gave me a part-time job, I think two days a week, and also for Emma, two days a week, to, to take what we learned on project one and apply it to project two. So again, this is like recycling on a on a higher level. Uh, I realized that we had to take every component of the first project and recycle it into the second. We weren't starting again. We were taking what we created at the first place and moving it to the second. So this is how it went. Um, This is this is um, some mycelium. This is a fungus that the high fever fungi. It's actually between two planks of wood. I planted the wood and I saw that, and I saw how the web, the shape, the complexity of that, the way that the mycelial pattern works. And I thought, hmm, that's a model for our garden. That's a model for a community project. It has to have a web of connections going in all directions, and trying to join everyone into that system and process. So the, 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 what, what happened was, this is the story, is uh, this is a uh, sixth form college. This is where 17, 18 year old kids go to learn vocational skills and farming, hairdressing, you know, motorcycle mending, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, cooking, I don't, I forget, I don't know what. Um, so there's the buildings and there's their car park. And the college had acquired this bit of land and the, there's a, a little bungalow there and a and a, a agricultural shed. And because they teach about farming and, 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 and stuff, they, they'd acquired this site maybe as a horticulture center or something, but they hadn't used it. And then they heard about us and they heard about our project and they said, do you know what? This is an unused plot of land. We're not quite sure what to do with it. Uh, would you like to have it for 10 years, notionally? And, and um, you know, we like what you did at, at, on at, at the first project. Maybe you could do something like that here. So there it is. There's standing on there is that, uh, if we look at that tree there, um, here we are, into the land. 
Um, seeing what it looks like. There's the same railway goes past here, uh, and then embankment, and there's, a, there's say the three fields as we can see, one, two, three, and a, a little garden in front of the cottage, and access into there. So great! What what great resource and. We started to just you know get the size, get the shape of the of the of the, of the land, and start to tame it a little bit, and then we started to we invited everyone that we knew who had interacted with our first project, and we brought them together for a meeting, and we said, "What do you want, guys? Um, how do we meet your needs? How if we create a, a, some kind of a permaculture, horticulture, demonstration learning center, what what what? How should we do it?" You know what 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 do you want how could we make it you know suitable to you and and we laid out our vision i love the idea of designing the course designing the center sorry designing the the, the project with students and through students um uh, so that was an important idea for us as well um Okay, right. Hello. I'm going to just pause for a short, short second to say, um, stop share. Oops, sorry. Um, yes, Gerald. Um, what maybe yes, too. you could do is if, if, if it's a bit early to take a break, but there's another slideshow on, on the page. Yeah. You, you, so this is, I'm, I'm just about the Arkleton meeting. So Stella, have they sent us a link for the Arkleton meeting? Is that what your message was? Yes, they have already sent us the meeting for the Arkleton. Okay. Uh, well, do we want to, minutes past. Do, do you want to, would, do we, how should we manage it? Should we attend their meeting one at a time? I think it is good for us to attend their meeting briefly in a break. Yeah. We really keep it so brief so that we come back to class. Yeah. Okay. Well, or, or or I could carry on, and if you went and said hello, and then I could we could swap. I don't know if that's a bad idea. General, what do you think? I, I was suggesting we, think, we have a break for a few minutes. Yeah. As we just we could log in talk and to have the a team talk here. See if you could brief the team. Yeah. And we pop in. And uh, is uh, thirty five now, yeah, or thirty six. So if we keep it as brief as possible, let them know that we've uh, jumped out of another uh, yeah well, training. Well, can and I then, suggest? Uh, sorry, but can I suggest that if 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 you would go and say hello to them, uh, either Gerald or Stella, I'll carry on teaching, and then you can come back and report, and then I I'm very because I'd like to say something to them. But I don't want to. Okay. Steve. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, I could hold foot here. I could uh, carry on with the team here. Okay. We can do discussions interactively. Okay. So you, you and Stella are there. Okay. Okay. So that's a good idea then. So what, what I suggest is um, what I'm interested in is it, I'm trying to set up, I'm telling the story of a design project that I had a hand in. I want you to be thinking about what's your design project. And and, and so we, we could talk about that a little bit, uh, Gerald, with them. And then I'm just going to put, where's the chat? Sure, I, I can go and pick up the uh, presentation already loaded. Yeah, so yeah, the, so one, the one that you could have a look at is the Sadimet. Oh, okay. And it's there on that link. If you go onto the page for today, you'll see it. Okay. So let me make you host. So you're now host. Okay, Steve. And I will check out and I'll come back. Uh, after I've reported to them. All right. Okay. Okay, Steve. You happy to be in charge? Yeah.
Yeah, okay. sure, I'll carry on. All right. Okay, see you then. Hi, everyone. Hi, Karen. Hi, Deborah. Simon. Are we OK uh, to yeah. carry on, or you, should we take a few minutes break and then resume, or is OK to carry on? Better to carry on, because uh, for me, I wasn't there. Okay. I'd like to hear something from you. OK. What do the rest suggest? OK, briefly for January's case. Um, yeah, basically what Steve has been going or has been uh, deliberating, deliberating about through the last about one hour, about one hour, because it started at uh, 4.30. So he's been uh, going through basically the process, how they started off with uh, an isolated or wasted space and transformed it into a very productive space. If you could look at that presentation or the entire presentation, it's a combination of most of the principles and ethics uh, basically creating no waste. They found the place with lots and lots of what was essentially wasted materials or what would have been ordinarily useless stuff. Did a proper survey, did a proper observation, your principle number one, observe and interact. And then after that, identified what is locally available on top of what is already there. So what is appearing to be waste and then what resources, active resources are locally available for the team to carry on. They had a limited budget, but still utilized that. But the beauty with it is you convert, instead of having to pay for wood, for instance, they didn't pay for the wood, they used the offcuts. Yeah. In other words, that money that would have been would have gone to paying for the wood or paying for the timber in case they were to use uh, something else or to pay for the bricks because they used the wooden structure. That money would is now used for something else to make the project even bigger. So that implies if you look within your waste stream, identify alternatives, identify alternative resources. That is one, going to help you save. Two, it's going to help you clean up the environment or declutter your space yeah, without causing additional pollution. Are we together? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what he's been talking about is that we, um, you could again look at the video because it's being streamed. So you would look at the video afterwards and it would really be helpful because it's a whole story. He detailed it as an entire story right from the start, how it all started, how he teamed up with volunteers. Because even human, you can you look at, am I able to get free or cheap human resource? Or am I able to collaborate? Am I able to partner up with people to carry on? Yeah, they are what we call stages of viability. Buying or purchasing or spending money should be at the last end of the entire process. 
if you can you know get it freely well and good if you can rent it or if you can partner up or collaborate and because sometimes in this case you end up purchasing things that you're not really going to use over and over again for instance maybe you're doing a construction and you're buying tools and you're not planning to call, to do construction again in the near future and you're purchasing them expensively is there no alternative for you to hire them which is slightly cheaper or are you able to acquire these from uh, from maybe a, um if from a friend who is probably not using them currently so you could look at the, all those processes yeah as your option to to outright purchasing or outrightly you know going ahead to purchase something which you may or may not need at the point Okay, I'm going to share just a second. Any questions, please? So basically, this is what we've been talking about. Yeah. We are into the design phase of our principles. We are into the design phase of our PDC. Because yeah? if you look at the split, or if you're having, I don't know if any one of you has uh, the simplified manual with them, the trainer manual with them, the first six are mainly on utilization and observation. The first six principles. Now, at this point where we are, we are into the last six, which are more emphasizing the design process, more emphasizing placement because design is basically more about placement and timing yeah so there are processes there are tools that you can utilize yeah there are processes that can also be incorporated they could be as simple as possible something like the submit design process yeah, is basically to guide you. But the whole thing is you look at, let's say, the client, then the survey, look at the areas of cost, observed experience, analysis, and then the functions. This might be in no particular order, but at the end of the day, is you know calling for your active observation, is calling for your active analysis, is calling because by doing survey, where is it linking to? It's linking to your observe and interact. As I earlier mentioned. These principles don't exist in isolation. Yeah, they are intertwined, they are interlinked. So as we go through, it's not sequential, but rather you have continuous linkages. 
and it's going to be the case. So if we are looking at the survey stage, what would you look out for? Yeah, because so under the survey stage, which is your initial stage, which is your basic stage, you can look out for all these. The site itself. Do you want to do out a map? Do you want to zone out and do sectors? So zones will look will I think discuss it in the next either session or even this, we could briefly look at it. Zones are usually drawn out. They could be clearly drawn out or otherwise, but these are based on utilization. For instance, zone one is where you have your house, your house or even your area of continuous utilization. That's your zone one. Zone two could be the next zone, which is frequently used, yeah, but not as frequent as zone one. And then within zone one, I mean zone two is where you're going to have bits of, let's say, your vegetables or those other elements that need your constant supervision and maintenance. For instance, let's say your cow shed or probably your chicken shed or anything, you know they need attention and they need your security. So if you are looking at the zones, you're not going to put it in zone four, which is nearly in the plantation because you need to be constantly looking out for them both for security and then also for maintenance or you know uh, caring for them or looking out for them so that's what it means by zones and sectors sectors you you go ahead and partition or identify areas let's say depending on the physical conditions, you identify, let's say, areas of high traffic flow, which can be human or otherwise. Obviously, that also helps you in, in your design process. Yeah, You can look out for things like the wind. This will help you in various aspects. If you know the direction of the wind, where does the wind come from? Where does the sun set and where does it rise? Or where does it rise and where does it set from? You know that all those aspects are important when you're doing your design or when you're you know, coming up with or setting up any, maybe just for simplicity purposes. We shouldn't look or think of designs as very complex from a very complex perspective. You can look at a design, let's say, as your household or your home is a design. Maybe you have your home and then the farm or your garden. That's a design. And if you remember, one of the principles is integrate and not segregate. So you're not looking at individual elements. How do you collaboratively combine them? Or how do you look at them as a system? That's what we are looking at here. So you you shouldn't think of design you know from the complex or very complex aspect to it simplify it to the very basic something like your home and you can keep growing it 
up to the point of your influence or up to the community level, but starting off with a small elements, small and slow solutions. So starting from the very basic unit and you keep growing it up. Well, knowing that the more you design within your area of influence, the better. So you're not going to put up a design for an entire, let's say, village, which you have no control over. Yeah? You're doing a design for the area within which you have control. Maybe you could influence other people now to do the same. And in the process, either you have a combination of numerous designs or working towards a single objective, which is sustainability or you know, becoming more uh, environmentally sensitive or becoming more sustainable and, and productive on the other hand. So we've seen the maps, we've seen the sectors, we've seen the wind. You look at the soil, yeah, because you're looking at the site. But you know, you you look. These are the elements that you could look around the site. You start laying them out. You start identifying them out. Yeah. Uh, the climate indicators, site indicators. If you happen to do Google or do any kind of research and you look at plants as indicators or you look at other factors, or, but mainly here, for instance, if I decide to go to a specific site, what do you think if, if uh, that site is ordinarily dry, but then I happen to see a specific place with sort of a bush or with uh, rather well grown out grasses? What would come into your mind? What would you think of in the process? Hello. Peter. Yeah. Yes, yes Nicholas. Uh, do you want me to repeat this? Assuming our site is ordinarily dry, we know it's a dry space or a dry place, but then there is this one piece of that site that has sort of overgrown uh, overground bush or overground grown grasses. What can we sort of, what can that point to? It, could it indicate that probably that place is on the lower side of our site, and most likely most of the water settles at that point. And maybe as the water goes down, it's carrying, washing all the topsoil from somewhere else and dumping it there. So the crops or the grasses at that point are doing well. So that's the kind of thinking. Thus, now you start asking questions but basing on what you've seen, maybe that can prompt you to do additional investigations or to do uh, further investigations or to try and find out more. Maybe we've gone to a place and most of the shrubs there are thorny. However much we are new to, to that site, what could could it indicate thorny, 
thornish shrubs, probably with uh, thinner leaves uh, that are having a smaller surface area. Could it be an indication that it's a dry place? And then most likely have, yes, Simon. Oh, Carol, is it Caroline? Yeah, I think that could be the case that is in the semi arid area with uh, very poor soil, probably sandy, you know, and uh, very little rainfall. Uh, yes. That's the kind of vegetation uh, that grows in uh, such areas. Yes, that's brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Yes, yes, Simon. Yes, to the best of my knowledge, in that kind of a place, it has got all the necessary necessary elements that have supported the growth of that thing. Where I mean the portability of that position is too high and it has really maintained the water content in that position. The water there is moderate that has supported the growth of that shrub. To me, that is what I think. The conditions necessary for it to grow are there and the portability it is self is present at that time. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, sure. We can, you know, at the end of the day, get lots of, uh, we can use even plants or the soil or anything as indicators, yeah? to initiate deeper discussions or deeper investigations. Yes, it could be arid, it could be dry, it could be that maybe there, there are conditions to facilitate that plant to grow. Maybe because it's thorny, it could be that it's, it's way of protecting itself from uh, uh, animals, eating it up. So it could be that probably that area has animals that, you know, eat leaves and the only kind of shrub or tree that could survive is the one with thorns. So all those can fall under these site indicators with plants as an example. microclimate, water, vegetation, assets, and things like fire. So this is calling us now to put principle number one into action, to deeply observe. Observe all those and then interact or make out sense out of them. Can you now, you know, translate however much you know having anyone tell you anything or even having anything written, but using those you're able to make out or determine what kind of site you have so that it's informing your decision or your next steps. Still under survey, so you've looked at the site you can, if you're working probably with a client, then who are those clients? Assuming you're, assuming you're working now as a, let's say you have a project that you're working on. As Steve said, 
when they were doing that project, they had a client or a council that they were working with, someone who was funding it. You need to understand what resources do they have so that you fit the project within there. Yeah. What are their values? You don't want to start off by, you know, rubbing shoulders or uh, we call it conflicting or creating, you know, friction with the client or the people that you're working with. And you can only do that if first of all, you understand what their values are. I'll give an example. You don't want to go to a client who is Muslim and you're proposing that your solution is to introduce pigs on their site. That could be part of you trying to understand their values. Yeah. Their goals, what do they look at? What are they aiming for, for this process? What are their limitations? Limitations, because at the end of the day, some usually for projects or for anything, you, you're there to solve a problem or a limitation or a constraint you're coming up with a solution, but you can only develop a targeted solution or a specific solution when you know the problem. And in life or even in other aspects of life, the, one of the mistakes you could make or one of the tricky situation you could place yourself is to try and develop a one size fits all solution. Yeah. We could try, but then it makes lots and lots of sense. It makes it rather easier if you get to understand the constraints or the limitations. Then look at the er areas of cost or call them leaks, yeah? What is likely, because a leak is like an escape point, or where you having sort of a mismatch? Is it time? Is it that the soils are probably depleted and infertile? Is it that the water is maybe not sitting on or, you know, soaking in. And we know what it means if, if water is unable to soak into a ground or it, it doesn't mean that it just walks away, but as it walks away, it takes your topsoil with it. Yeah. Is it a case of labor so that you design your system to be less labor intensive? Is it money so that you can try to be as cost effective as possible? And nutrients, so you could interlink the nutrients and the soil, because this is a scenario. We, we, you're working bottom up, not top, top bottom. In the conventional setting is where someone will say, oh, I need nutrients. And then they will look out for the foliar fertilizers and all that. But if you need nutrients, we know that they are best stored in the soil because that's where the plant is feeding from. You're looking at sustainability. Yeah. 
Any questions up to that point? Yes, Simon. You know, in the process of link, it indicates that linking itself, it explains to us the process as to which the elements that are found in the soil are lost. And then therefore, when those elements have been lost from the soil, then automatically the soil itself would have lost all the available elements and nutrients that would have supported the growth of that crop in that soil. Eventually, the soil remains barren or infertile, whereby, whereby it will no longer support the growth of that what eh? of, 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 of the growth of plants in that particular area where all those elements or minerals have been linked out. So that aspect of linking does not generally support the, 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 the presence of those components in the soil. So by that process, it will again need you to bring more, 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 more knowledge of recovering back the micro living organisms and macro organisms that would have generated the portability and so forth of the soil to it is original value before it had lost out of it. Thank you. That is what I wanted to add on that link as you were explaining it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Simon. You know, that is deeper. Yeah. And that is in depth. Thanks you, Simon, for that in-depth explanation and still connecting it back to our design system or connecting it back to how now you're using a specific element or a specific area to inform your decision making. Okay, so we've looked at the still under the survey you have to also now remember one of the things we uh agreed or we always emphasize that permaculture utilizes the richness of indigenous knowledge or locally available knowledge one of the resources that we mainly rely on is that knowledge. Because it's from that, you know, we have elders usually who you don't need to tell that it's midday. So they will know. And how do they know? It's because of that inherent knowledge or because of that expertise they have they will simply look at the sun and know that it's midday. Even when the sun is not necessarily there, they will know because they have that knowledge and experience. And time telling is just one of them. You could find, I remember some people that would know just by the wind and how it's blowing, they will know that this is just simple wind you don't have rain, however much you could have lots of clouds up there, but they have that local or indigenous knowledge and expertise in them. They've probably lived in that area for so many years or throughout their lifetime. So they know the dynamics around it. They know all the aspects they will be able to warn you when probably a storm is coming and where it comes from. So that is what we refer to as another element that you could highly make use of. Local knowledge, the elders. And then 
also other people who have done what you're doing or other designs. This is interactions. You don't necessarily need, need to pay someone off, but through you know, creating linkages with your community or through collaborations and cooperation, you can freely acquire all these, yeah? Which would be really costly if you're to go in, let's say for a consultancy or to, you can't even have a price tag to this. So as you do your survey, you can also look out, are there people who locally have the knowledge? Are there elders I could utilize in the process? Because they know it all. They've been there, they have the experience and they have the knowledge. Are there people who have done it before? Because you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not doing something extremely new. You could be having a few approaches that are slightly new or maybe you've slightly improved, but the reality is other people have done it before. So are you able to utilize bits of their design or even their design to inform or to modify yours or to form a basis for yours? So after all that is done, now you can look at uh, starting now to visualize. That's when you start doing things like the base map, which is like your very initial draft. Yeah. But after you've done that, remember you're looking at the initial, but then you have a very important function here or a very important step here, feedback. Remember one of, your, of, of the principles we looked at is actively inviting or emphasizing the use of feedback. Yeah. Actively pick up the feedback and apply self-regulation. Self-regulation is how do you now remote? How do you adapt? If we have done the base map and probably started doing the initial, very initial or the basic setups, and implementations, how do I now start to receive that feedback? Remember small and slow solutions. Uh, there is uh, a quote that I love about it or the tagline, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yeah, so small and slow solutions, receive the feedback, tweak your design and, you know, keep improving it. So from the feedback, then you proceed again to analysis. You've received the feedback, you look at the analysis. You receive the feedback, analyze it and that is going to help you improve your design. Yeah. What are the functions? Oh, because yes, in the survey, or even at this point, you could further look at what functions are your design or each of the elements in your design supporting are they trees that are helping you with wind breaking 
remember at this stage when we were doing the survey we looked out for where the wind is coming from are you now able to place after understanding the okay okay january uh, it was good to have you anytime you can log on when conditions allow and you watch the live stream on, on youtube the rec and, and the recording actually so the you've you've de drawn out your design you've you know done your survey now it's time you know to do that relevant placement you know where let's say the wind is coming from where you need to place wind breakers or maybe where you put, you need to put stronger let's say elements or trees so that they can be able to protect the weaker ones i think you're starting to see how now each process is helping you or giving you the basis for the next or to now the establishment of your design you start looking at the protection the energy fertility privacy remember we talked about your sectors and one of them we agreed that you need to look out for which bits of your design or your property or your area has lots of traffic and as long as you need privacy or anything needs privacy you're not going to place it at where you have lots of traffic or whether it's in form of people or uh, vehicles or otherwise yeah um then you start looking at things like for the conservation heat so this is functions now starting to attach specific functions to specific elements but then taking a well-informed decision means you've gone through all these and it has to be as you know as simple as it is whatever we are looking at don't look at it from uh, let's say a very complex standpoint or from you can look as far as a simple household. Once you have this, you can refine it to the next best map, which is best map two. Yeah, because you're looking at, you've improved everything. You've related or attached specific functions to specific elements. So you can proceed and now have your refined base map utilizing the feedback and also the analysis that you've done. Do you realize that at each and every point, feedback is an integral bit of it? It has to be not a straight line walk, but it's a cycle as long as you're going to improve anything you can't stay away from feedback so likewise for our design we have to rely on feedback to inform our next steps if for instance i've uh, placed my cow shed at a specific point and most of the cases probably i'm finding it wet or flooded or muddy whenever it rains that is feedback that maybe this is a lower point 
I could either utilize that feedback, improve my design, and maybe relocate it to somewhere, or even put measures in place to redesign or to, to control that flooding. Okay. I know this sometimes gets a little bit uh, not confusing per se, but it's all about uh, systems thinking. It's all about now starting to put or to put together all the principles, the ethics, and even the underlying ideas together. Yeah. Any questions, Carlos, Simon? Um, uh, yes. You know, you're doing quite well. Just go on. Uh, it's um simple. It's simple and uh, me, I'm understanding. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. I like it. Okay. Okay, that's good to hear. You know, it's, it's about now the visualization aspect of this. It's about bringing it to life is about now starting to think creative or starting to take things to the next level yeah this is now the practical aspects to it and one of the things i've realized over time you could have the first six principles all lined up but if the design aspect is not linking up, then your efficiency or the rate at which you're likely to meet up your objectives or to meet up your target is going to be delayed or even hard. You're supposed to have a sync. Your you know, either mindset, the thinking, and then the design are supposed to interact. If you don't have proper placement, however much deep down you, you're trying so hard to properly utilize your resources. If you haven't put, you know, tools, and elements in place to support you achieve that, you're going to lose it. Yeah. So that's why it's important to understand the design process or to really emphasize this or try so much to see that you have the right placement and the right timing. Okay, let's go to, you've done the best map too, which is like your improved design. And this has, to, you can make this as simple as possible. It doesn't have to be super complex. I know there are very good designs out there, but we are not all artistic. The key thing is, even if you're using circles or you're using boxes, are you able to, understand it or are you able to int to interpret it or even explain it to anyone who wants to understand yeah so it doesn't have to be very complex very simple it's, it takes us back to form and function 
you have the feedback after that feedback feedback fit system systems stroke elements to fulfill the functions it's good to look at things that because they are looking good but then if they are not meeting a specific function or if they are not providing support to the system then i i would personally somehow call it a loss it's probably they are skipping out on a specific principle our obtain a yield probably the yield we were looking at is for that element to play a specific role within our system this is what it means fit systems or elements to fulfill specific functions go on with the design emphasize the placement yeah and then looking at again evaluating because it's continuous it's a continuous process it's a cycle it's not a straight line that it has you know once you have a cycle or a circle it's endless you don't have that this is where it ends it's continuous it keeps running even in your 10th year you can still keep improving this yes caroline oh i'm sorry no, no worries yes bye no worries so you have to continuously evaluate and that's where we are going to look at evaluation and tweaking so as you look at your system then you start asking after you've established it so you're looking at what's going well what's challenging and ooh, just a second sorry what's going well what's challenging what is against my aims or objectives and what is running continuously as required these are going to help you either if you identify the challenges where you identify challenges obviously that's feedback then you'll need to go in and tweak to tweak is to modify or to improve yeah then what is counterproductive what is going opposite or against your aims and objectives because when you're setting up your system you have specific objectives that you want to ultimately or specific goals that you want to ultimately achieve so you're looking out what is coming in the way because sometimes you set up elements or you you put up specific systems within your design that probably end up contract contradicting or interfering with your overall goal and aim yeah so you go on to also improve that or you may find in the process of tweaking for you to achieve the bigger objective probably you may have to find a way of creatively eliminating this specific system or element but then it all goes back if because i know the next question is isn't that going to be costly if you followed our principle small and slow solutions it will not be costly but rather it will be a learning experience if you had taken gigantic strides or massive strides or steps 
then unfortunately it could be a painful lesson or a costly adjustment. Hi, Steve. Hi, how, how are you getting on? You look yeah, like sure, you've made some we, good progress. Yeah, sure, we had run up towards the end. Maybe you could do a quick run through. <coughs> Taken the team. Sure. Yeah. I I could stop sharing and you can share from your end. Okay. Okay, please. Uh, maybe do we have any questions so that Steve can incorporate mm -hmm. those in uh, in the presentation? I I, I don't know whether so I, I over to you, Steve. Th th thank you, thank you, Gerald. Thank you very much for for for, for stepping in there. Um, I'll I'll chat about the meeting in in a few minutes. I'll maybe wait till see if Stella can return. <clears throat> so I did. There's that wonderful spider diagram of Chris Evans's that you were looking at there, Gerald. And I like the fact that it feeds back on itself, and it tells us that the design process doesn't end because uh, we're always evaluating and then you know going on and making changes. Um, I, I, I created another a breakdown of that. So there's, there's a little P, PDF on the web page that you can take, you can look at, which takes us through the. So it begins with observation, um, and we've got to observe the client, the site, and then what else? What information can we find around? And yeah, what are the leaks? Where's the energy running out of the of the site? And that that might be the places where we can make the most impact most quickly. So we're going to do a survey of the the client. Now that might be you. Um, and sometimes it's it's difficult to design for yourself. So I I always sort of say it's it's kind of like an interesting role play. There's the designer is with one hat and then the client with the other hat. Now that might both be you, but you still want to, to go through this in a conscious informed process. I want to, you know, to see people have these dialogues. So what are the functions? Why are we doing this? What do we hope to achieve? What are our, what's our goal? What, what's the outcome of our design? And let's be specific about it. Because if we can name it and be clear about what we're aiming to achieve, we can keep coming back and asking us, ask ourselves that key question. Are we meeting our goals? Are we fulfilling the function of the design? Now, of course, people are complicated. People have values, ethics, priorities, tastes, all sorts of different um, things. What are yours or what are the client, the person that you're working with or the client group? Understand so that you're design ideas and your design process is relevant and at, you know, to the chart to the intended group and you know what's your budget what resources do you have if you can see what's lying around if you can build a design within available resources then you can start immediately if you start with some crazy ambitious plan and it's going to be great but you need fifty thousand dollars then okay you're going to be sat waiting for the fifty thousand dollars Let's try and come up with something that we can do now. We can begin. It doesn't cost any money to make compost. It doesn't cost any money, you know, to start um, catching and storing energy and, 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 and so forth. And what are the constraints? Okay, I'm, I'm sure you've gone through all of this, Gerald, so in, in, in that diagram. But again, I just I laid it out in another way. And I want to give, make sure that we think of each one of these things. And also, these lists aren't exhaustive. So you, you might, I'm sure there's things that we've left out. I always like to tell this story though. So be clear of the borders and boundaries of the site you're designing. And I always like to tell this story when, when I was a, a kid, when I was a youth, me and a friend, we were working on a local farm and the farmer gave us these big shears, big cutters. And they said, oh, that top field, we're going to harvest it tomorrow. Can you, any big tall weeds that sticking out, can you cut the tops off with the things? And we spent all day doing it. And at the end of the day, we're walking down the field and the farmer's leaning on the gate. And uh, he said, have you done all right? We've done a good job. He said, well, you've done a good job, but there's just one problem. 
It's not my field. We kind of worked in the wrong field. So <clears throat> that's my funny story. But so you need to be clear about the space that you're designing. And I think these aren't necessarily in order, but is water's always the ultimate limiting factor in a design. If you haven't got any, it, you, you can't do anything. And if you have too much, it's really destructive. It's really, you know, so uh, when we, we're in, doing a survey, we're interrogating the site. We need to extract that information. And remember, you might know the answer to some of those questions, but what if the other people on, the, on your project, on your team, don't know the answer to those questions? So, you know, let's think about in, in some ways in which we can communicate these ideas clearly. Um, we're going to also survey observed experiences. What's the history of the site? What do the people next door, what do they remember? Is other local knowledge? You know, perhaps design work's been done already. Um, and then understanding, looking at our survey of our land is, um, is the soil erosion? Well, what happens to the water? Uh, you know, are we catching and storing energy? And if we're not, what are the leaks? What, what are the, the, the costs that we're incurring that we could avoid? What could we do to stop them? And your design is going to address whatever design it is that you do, it's got to speak to what you, the survey for part of your, of this process. So that's the key, key thing. And that was the thing I wanted to stress um, today. And if we have the opportunity, we write down or represent a picture or a model or a, a, a anything um what, what we what we we what we what we have surveyed and um and, and and we you know we test out those ideas with the by giving our feedback to the client group and check that we've you know we're getting it right the more we discuss things so here's here's a permaculture rule they like to say is make your mistakes on paper Make your mistakes in the planning and evaluation stage, not on the land itself. We don't want to be wasting energy, time, resources, putting things in the wrong place, not knowing where the boundary is, building something that then washed away in a flood. You know, we, we need to bring all of this information together before we start designing. Um, yeah, <clears throat> the analysis part is really focusing on the the functions of your design. And that might be obvious to you. Well, we just want to grow some crops. Yeah, but what crops and why? And let's think about, you know, maybe it's more, let's think about the impact that might have on wildlife or on your neighbors or, um, you know, how it might fit in with your other goals. Okay, so I I, I made this today, this, this, this slideshow. So um, you can use that, use this as, as, a, as a checklist to think about, we're going through our SADIMET, which is survey, um, which ends in the first base map, and then analysis, which is asking the questions, which it creates the second base map. And then we then begin to think about the design process. And we only think about the design process, like what are we going to have and where are we going to put it and all of these kind of details. We don't think about that until we've thought about the, in the survey and the analysis. That's, that's the big lesson. Don't rush in and start doing things before you've done the thinking. And I think that's the lesson we want to take from this. And um, I'll jump out of that. And it's there on the website as a resource. Um, and should we offer a break, uh, Gerald? We've... Um, should we just have a short break, perhaps for until, what do you think? Yes, we could have uh, maybe for eight minutes. That's up to. Come back at uh, 10 to. Yes, 10 to. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll, we'll just, I'll pick up on the other half of what I was talking about before. Oh, let me just say one thing, though. Gerald, as well. So we just had the work that we've been doing. We've had a bit of funding from a private trust in the UK called Arkelton Trust. And we that, that project's now finished. And and they wanted we had to make a formal report back to them about what we've achieved. 
So we've just been talking about that and they are delighted. They really love our report. They love our feedback, all the stories they've heard about TAPA, about UPO, about Perm Africa, about Rwandan women. They're really super impressed and they've, they've really sent a warm uh, thank you and recognition to us. So we need to translate that into more funding and more, but, but um, we just presented to a team of people who've, who've made some notes and they're very, very impressed with the impact that we've had, the changes that we've actually made to real people. So uh, well done, everyone. So that was- yeah, Thank that. you. And I can see Stella is also back. Thank you for representing and yeah, well done everyone. Well done, Deborah, well done, Simon. Caroline. So it's about a team and all of us. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. You don't need to necessarily log out. We're going to be back in about five minutes, just taking a short break, grab a cup of tea, and then we go for the last session, last part of the session. All right, see you in five minutes. See you.
Okay, th thanks everyone. Uh, slightly early, actually. Give another minute. <clears throat> You don't need to hear me slurping my tea. Okay, I think we're back now. Is everyone back? Let me just get a, a thumbs up, a virtual thumbs up up as the as steve gets ready any questions any comments yeah steve is ready let's mm. thanks i hope thank thank you gerald for filling in there I, and i realized of course when i left the meeting i stopped recording it but you will be recorded on the uh, the youtube uh, stream so anyway still learning how to juggle this um <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to, um, I, I, I just got to the halfway point of my story. I, I'm just seeing your question as well, Caroline. Let me just think about that as well. So the key thing about how we might use land or anything is we're interested in what's the function of your design. And, 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 and I'm going to challenge you to write them down. So, yeah, grow food or whatever it is. But is we've also got to build soil. We've got to think about the impact on the, the nature and wildlife. I think there's going to be many considerations to that. And that how we might approach land use would be, well, is the land wet, too wet, or is it too dry? Is it, is it you know, what, what, what check, how do we modif modify it to, to suit the intended function that we have? So um, anyway. Good question, and keep asking them. And and if I haven't answered it, ask it again, because uh, you know that's how we get to the get to the nub of it. Um, okay, so um, you should better see my community garden slide of a little uh, apple tree. And what I'd said was, I'd run my community garden um a project for two years at a location on an industrial estate and it actually wasn't a very welcoming place it was a bit smelly and a bit noisy and and it wasn't close to housing whereas the new site that we were offered is there's re uh, housing units here and there's, a, there's obviously a busy college of students there um that big sawmill i mentioned that's on the other side of this road here and on that side is the railway. Um, so we actually thought with our design is the elements that we place in on this land, that green triangle, um, are going to fulfill a range of different functions because we want to grow food. We want to support wildlife and biodiversity. We want to do things in an interesting way that we can learn and other people can learn. And we've got things to teach about. Um, what we do needs to also meet the needs of the college. What, 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 as a neighbor, what could we do that would help build a relationship with them? Well, some of their pupils needed certain types of activities. Um, and, um, you know, could we construct opportunities for people from this side? Um, we understood that this was a social housing project, this side, and that some of the people living on that side, you know, our other neighbours also had, you know, social needs and, and, and could the, were there things that we could do within the garden that would help engage and build a relationship with them? We could think about what, what did the, the, the railway going past, what did that mean, if anything? Uh, there's a big road here, you know, again, is that important? And on the other side of the road, oh, there's the, the 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 sawmill that has lots of of, of timber so those are our um you know there's some initial thoughts of our site survey and um you know taking an overview look of of of, of the opportunity that we had um 
seen there's the railway embankment, there's the main field. And as I was saying before, it's, so the first thing we've realized, our real resource was the people, not the land, it's the people. We can solve all the land-based problems if we have, you know, a workforce. We have people who are, who, not, not a workforce, <clears throat> People who could see what their relationship to that land could be, how they might, might, they might benefit from it, how they might take part in it. And um, we invited um, uh, uh, those people to, 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 to share their ideas with us. We ran a little course. And on that course, we started to just brainstorm, to, to think out, well, the roundhouse, we like that. Where, we get, let's bring that with us. Where will we put it? And we put sticky notes on on the map of the of the land, and you know we thought, well, if we put that there, we could put that there. And, oh, but what about if we try that? Make your mistakes on paper. Allow yourself free range to explore your ideas. Try out something slightly crazy. What happens if we put this over there? You know, and if it doesn't work, put it back again. So we. We, 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 I think we had about eight or nine people for a week and we talked about permaculture design. We talked about community gardens we, and we walked around the site. We talked, we observed and we started to think, well, what would be the route in? What would be the pathway? What would be the access for people, access for vehicles? Could we make them separate because we don't want people and vehicles to, you know, come into contact? Um, How's nature, you know, how are birds or other wildlife going across our site? Or what will the neighbours think when they see us? We try we to think about all of those things. We thought, well, this, this, this the garden in front of the house could perhaps you know, be like a formal garden, a, a laid out garden, a nice space for children to play where they could be observed by their parents. We're going to need productive areas for growing. We're going to need er other areas, you know, for other functions. So as we, and I'm going to teach you in the second half of the course, beginning next week, we're going to talk about, we design from the patterns to the detail. So we see the wider picture, and then we then start to ask ourselves the questions, you know, layer on layer of, of, of placing then the detail within that space. And what I've learned is there are certain, the, the certain, the key elements in any design there's only going to be one or two places where you can put them. So get them in the right place first. The access road, the river, the, the, you know, the slope, um, where the key building is, if you have a building. Those, those are things that are only going to have so many opportunities of where to put them. So identify where they're going to be, put them on your map. You know, and if you get it wrong, you can always move it around. But then we start to identify what are the most important things, elements of our design, and can we make sure that we put them in the right place that will be influenced by roadways, by slope, by rivers, by soil quality, and, and you know, tangible, measurable things. And then <clears throat> once we've got those key things in, um, I blocked this out because that's where cars are, so I thought about that's potentially dangerous. Um, I realized that there was a, a people uh, reception area in the middle. Um, we're going to have formal laid out gardens on the front here. Look, looking interesting, interesting shapes. And, and then also have between the center of the hub and, and where the college is, we'll put in our training and demonstration areas and, and um, you know, think about where's the right place to put things. And then over in this side, of the garden was where again we had another set of ideas to create our forest garden area and and, and, and so forth without getting into the details of the project too much but it's and then we drew a picture we printed the picture and we invited everyone who came to the launch meeting to come back and here's some local you know men in suits important people the town mayor councillor whatever um chief executive of our organization who had them plant a tree. So we told very clearly to the college, to the owners of the land, this is our plan. Here it is. Here's a picture of it. And this is why we're doing it. It's because we want to create opportunities for community, for the school, for the neighbors, for wildlife. That's why it's going to look like that. So 
if you, if you lay out your plan like that in a very clear way, people can ask questions, they can become comfortable with what you're doing, and say, I took a photo of them all, and I put it in the local paper, so it makes sure they couldn't go back and change their minds. I felt like, you know, we'd, we, we now had permission to go ahead with our project. And there's our little story, get growing, plan takes root. Nice kind of pun that they put in newspapers. Um, so there we go. We're off, off we go with our new project. And the college, because they liked our ideas, fitted out that, the little bungalow bit as a classroom so we could have, um, you know, uh, teaching spaces. Um, in the agricultural shed, we put storage units so we could store our vegetables and carry on our uh, veg supply to local suppliers. We brought our nursery with us. Every plant that we'd created at the first garden, we dug it up and we brought it to the second garden. We didn't want to leave anything behind. Um, <clears throat> now, because we were in a more accessible part of town, we had uh, youngsters come and train with us. And we had a design for the garden, so we had clear uh, instructions of what people were to do. And <clears throat> we engaged them in you know, tasks, you know, yeah, quite laborious, hard work. But after a few days, what we found was the volunteers came to us with questions. Oh, why are we doing this? And why is it? And slowly had a chance then to incorporate their, <coughs> them in the planning and the understanding of what we were doing. You know, funnily enough, this young man here, um, he's like 16 in this picture, and it's one of his first work experiences. Uh, about a year ago, I bumped into him in a supermarket, completely out of context. And I recognized him and he recognized me and said, all right. And I said, all right. And we greeted each other and that was it. But it was just like, that's an outcome for me. Um, that person, a young person had a positive experience and 10 years later, he sees me in the street and he remembers, you know, that's, that, that, that's when we know we're doing something right. Here we're building our experimental beds. It's Hugel culture beds, which I think I have talked about. And um, <clears throat> as we developed our little permaculture demonstration center, we realized that every interaction was a chance to make a new friend. Here's our, with our youth uh, exp uh, a person. Here's, here's um, this is another permaculture group. Uh, this woman was working in a bank before. This is the caretaker from our local school. And there's a, a carpenter builder from up the road. You can see everything as an opportunity to learn. Everything is opportunity to extend, your, you know, demonstrate the potential of permaculture. What you're seeing here is cool, temperate permaculture. These strategies work well in our climate. So think about how these might translate slightly to fit into other climate zones. Here we're doing formative pruning on a fruit tree, but we're not just doing the shaping of this tree, young tree, we're teaching about it, sharing that knowledge. Um, our micro allotment plots, this idea of having, allowing community members to have very small intensive gardens. Now that worked really well. So we carried the idea with us and, and as this center has developed, um, it's that's something which has grown and grown. Now, every, uh, um, yes, this is, this is, these are some of the, we designed a raised bed system. We, we some people wanted to have those. Um, as we realized that this gave us um, technology ideas to explore with the school and we could create different versions of integrated seats and, we all got a bit carried away. But I said we, were, we wanted to explore these kinds of ideas and we we're using these materials because they're for sale across the road, the sawmill. Next door to us is a college where they give te teaching people practical skills. So see how we could use our permaculture training center as a way to um, engage with different people, but also build the infrastructure that we wanted for our training center. Um, in the process of doing that, we realized that there were people in the community who would really wanted to learn hard skills of woodworking and so forth. So we could provide that, uh, tree grafting, um, outreach to, ah, anyway. Uh, oh, okay. So these are the early days. I've got another whole set of photos of what now this 
garden centre, this, this horticulture centre looks like now. Um, there you go. The, wasn't the whole purpose of this was not for me to tell you anecdotes, but to show how a design's a process. And that, think about what were the functions of the design of our training centre. We wanted to create spaces for people, spaces for learning, spaces for propagating plants, for growing main crop plants. We wanted orchards. We wanted intensive areas. We wanted areas that the public could come and learn on. And we also wanted areas that the public, individual members of the public might feel, oh, this is my garden. I did that and have that, you know, different people wanted different experiences. Some of the people who came were pain, one guy was painfully shy. He couldn't look you in the eyes. It was like that. And, <clears throat> but he came every week and we found that he liked making weaving things. And we designed a little gate or he designed a little gate sort of designed and he'd come back every week and make one and find little places in the garden to put it and um so again in that way of you're revolving an ecosystem and in that ecosystem there are niches for different people different activities for young people older people um not just creating a monoculture another field of maize let's think about how we could we, we understand we're creating complex systems or complex yeah a complex system that has within it numerous opportunities um yeah well, let me pause there gerald any any thoughts on that and help with the continuity from what you were talking about in when i was uh, absent um not really you've really put it out clearly and uh, <clears throat> I think this is now the ice. What I've been telling them is uh, more of the icing to the cake. This is now the contextualization of bringing together most of the elements or the previous sessions that we had looked at earlier. Back to you, Steve. Thank you for that and that reassurance as well. Thank you, Gerald. That's great. Um, okay, so we've got we've got twenty minutes. So we'll all have to work together on this and help each other. And 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 some people are missing bits. But is in the second half of the course, I want us to begin now to focus these ideas and the processes. There's lots more to share. There's lots more to go. But is how the question is how are you going to use these ideas in on yourself or your home or as a design project in your community i'm sure you have ideas already i'm sure you have things that you're already engaged in um um so let's use the second half of the pdc to help you visualize those and for you to start to come together with your own design ideas and I think that's going to be super interesting for all of us to see and um, uh, 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 what comes out from that. And, um, and then also, though, we can, be, we can be clear about what it is. I want to know what people, if we can share our objectives and we can build a plan and then perhaps we can communicate that objective out to the wider world. And that's how you win resources. That's how you win support. That's how you win investment. You know, every week I get dozens of people saying, well, can I just give them a bit of money for seeds or for this or for that? And the answer is, no, I can't. I'm, I'm not able to. But maybe as a group, if we can identify what we need sort of collectively and to create a vision, the kind of vision that has, you know, made our project successful with Arkleton or what made us successful in Kumhari in Newtown was we had a clear objective. We made people understand how both we and they and the, you know, the wider world will benefit from that objective and communicated it in a way in which we won support for our vision. We won support for that. So that's how we win resources. I don't have 
you know, if I, I wish it was an easier way or a better way, I don't have anything better to offer than, than that. But I think that if we follow this design process, this actually becomes a consensus tool. If you include people in your designing and planning, they then have ownership of that project. They feel part of it. They understand where it fits in. Why are we working on Deborah's garden? I'm not going to benefit from that. But now I go, oh, we work on Deborah's garden today and on my garden tomorrow and then your garden the next day. Now I understand. That's a design process that's inclusive and it involves communication and make people understand that ultimately we can all kind of participate and benefit. So I want to, I'm going to show uh, one more thing which I have put on the web page and it's an, it's a client checklist. Uh, this is a document that was created by Angie Polkey, uh, who's another Welsh permaculture colleague of ours, who I know that uh, Gerald knows. And it's good to mention sometimes these names, but to realize is, um, you just see me here sat in a room by myself, but there's a strong network of permaculture people here in, in Wales, and we've supported each other and known each other for many years. And, um, and that's what you're building in Uganda now. So these, these are tools which um, just help us think through this in a methodical way. It's not about right or wrong. No one's going to mark your work and give you a score out of 10. But what we, I'm, I'm trying to do is give you really simple but powerful tools allow people to come together, make long-term decisions based on ethics that then help the whole community benefit. So our client ch checklist, that is who are the beneficiaries of our design? Why, why are we doing this? And who is it for? Um, so what's our vision? So at Cum Harry, we had a vision to create a horticulture and permaculture demonstration and a center that was also highly productive, that was met the needs of the school and also of vulnerable people. That was our vision. Um, think about you know, your vision can be really narrow, can be very specific. Um, but, but you need to be able to identify and communicate it. What are what the wants or functions? What is it that you want? E.g. produce, aesthetics, that means how it looks, wildlife, play, relaxation, education, structures, access, animals, plants. If I just say, well, I want a garden, can you design me a garden? What am I? Nothing. As a designer, you need to ask the question to the client. Well, what kind of garden do you want, Steve? What's the purpose of your garden? Oh, it just has to look nice. Oh, OK. It needs to look nice. Oh, well, I've got room. Oh, you didn't tell me that. So now it's got to be child proof. See what I mean? You, as a designer, you need to pull out this information and think about um, and understand. Yeah, we want produce and it's got to look good and it's got to be child friendly. OK, let's balance that. How important is the produce? Is the look, you know, the more information you have, that the more that will shape and inform your design. Um, so what's the current situation? and limiting factors. And one way of looking at it is, well, why haven't you got one already? What's holding you back from achieving your goal? Why do you even need me as a designer? So I need to, we need to understand that as well. So you, you've got to sort of, it's all very well saying, well, I want a nature-friendly, child-proof garden. Well, why not? Oh, well, I haven't got any land and I, you know, I don't know. Again, back to this quiet, quiet client question. We need to understand the group a little bit better. What are their values? You know, if they're Muslim, you can't be telling them to have pigs or you can, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's a, a, a well, the more you can understand about the values and motivations of people, the more then that your design can be appropriate and relevant to their needs and their resources. Um, 
what skills and equipment do do they have um you might find that your client and it's usually that's something which you want to access you could use that as a strength oh they've got tools or, or they don't availability time and energy um yeah yeah what's the time scale when you, is this a three-month job or a three-year job do you own the land or the, or the, or the legal consideration what do we need to know chance for anything else other considerations and finance and resources completion date look it's a brainstorm you so the idea of course is you can extend this you make your own notes but look how Every time what we showed you in the SAD Dear Met, survey, analysis, design, implementation, uh, evaluation, and tweaking, um, the step, step by step, whole step by step starts with the survey of what? The client. Who's the client? Well, it might be you. It might be you and your family. It might be you, your family, your neighbors. It might be your workplace. But, but define it and be clear here and there's clients what's the vision what are the actually the because you might say i want a beautiful garden and i want everyone to be happy and everything is okay yeah but what functions must that garden do let's drill down get that detail down so i'm showing you the tools of the trade these are now your beginnings of your design tools i said permaculture is three things it's ethics it's principles it's design tools we've, looked, we've had a good in good we're at principle six so now i'm beginning to give us some of our design tools and our first design tool is thinking about sadimet as a process and realize that it starts off by surveying the client people before we start thinking about the land before we start thinking about anything else um it's a step-by-step -step process um if if we just have a moment what, what what i will do is i'll just take us to our web page um steve what yeah. i've been emphasizing to the team is not to think of systems as complex simplify them to the very basic unit and probably work upwards into that actually even within a single system you can have subsystems and build onto that very much so um see that now so uh, this is today's page bdc 23 12 everything cycles so there's a very simple system isn't it gerald the um I've got my fish tank ounce and so there's a relationship between the nitrates coming out of the fish tank um, feeding the plants and returning clean water back to the fish again as designers if we just look at individual elements we need to study the fish tank we need to study the pump we need to study the the reed bed but we also need to understand that they have a relationship with each other as a system a meta system now and what you just said Gerald is we could also just look at an element of that system like the reed bed and realize the reed bed oh that's a coin in itself so this is a system so it's that we can see worlds within worlds but we need to understand the relationship between those elements that's what we're trying to get into now to thinking about designing systems eliminate waste that's what we're doing is so use the existing available resources so there's a spider diagram which you can explore and which i think you did and there's links to um the client checklist the sadimet um presentation that i showed you and there's my community garden story if you want to have a look at that and so i'll place the video um i put a couple more resources that i wanted to just um, Tess Fahun had posted a lovely little short YouTube video of their first day 
at the Syntropic Agroforestry uh, event in, in Lalibela in Ethiopia. And he's super excited. I'm very much following this PDC. And, and uh, so I just wanted to share that with you and uh, do check it out and do, do follow Tess Fahun on, um, on YouTube. Um, I found a really fascinating article on uh, biochar. Uh, Tela Preta, mean the, meaning the black earth made with the biochar uh, by someone called Austin Liu. Um, you can click on there and access the article. It's on uh, a platform called Medium. It's free, but you have to log in. Um, I've cut, copy and pasted just the conclusions. The kind of the, the, the and very 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 interesting deep on the science of biochar and understanding on a much more deeper way just exactly how it works and and, and so forth but the take-homes are you, we need to be experimenting with this it's more co-composting your biochar so don't make the compost and then add the biochar after but compost the biochar you know build the compost yeah co-compost the biochar together and look this is your sukuma wiki here's your collard greens that's the plain compost that's with the biochar that's um again another brassica another cabbage family uh that's the plain compost compost composted biochar and again uh we're looking at pump pumpkins here as well um fantastic results and i've just put a link in i haven't Put anything more yet to Ali Tebendeki's uh, site, the uh, Permaculture Initiative Uganda um, at Butambala, and he's offering a PDC I see coming up as well. And um, getting guy, he's a really good teacher, and he's very much part of our network. And um, I'm trying to use this PDC and the academy as a tool to bring you guys together. So you feel like it doesn't matter where you are, whether in Kenya, you're in Uganda, you're in Rwanda, you're in Malawi, I don't mind where you are, you're in Wales, you're in Ireland. Um, we're all doing this together and we're all trying to share what we learn and, and support each other. And there we go. So, and, 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 and I've said this before, but there's a page obviously for each week and, and I find it a good way for myself to remember what I've taught and also, these resources are here for you. If you want to download them, have them on your phone, pick and choose one or two, have the whole course. I, I, I want to get this knowledge out there and I want to share it. And I'm encouraged that, so encouraged by the feedback we've had from the project and our evaluation from the project. And um, we're going to keep doing it. And permaculture runs on feedback. Permaculture runs on testing out assumptions by engaging with people and that's again what we're doing on our pdc and we want to get your feedback and that's why we challenge we're inviting you to the design challenge and that's very much a part of completing the course and getting your certificate and it's not a test there's no winners or losers there's no right right or wrong it's about you having the experience of going through that and we'll introduce it step by step in the coming weeks and i wanted to set that up this week so you know that's where we're coming and, and we're going to give you the tools to design set in motion your own project and then we'll use our collective platform to put a message out to the world and hopefully inspire people with what we're doing our vision what we're achieving and hopefully that might help also win us resources and new friends and help build new relationships which is exactly what permaculture is all about I'm just seeing your message. We're about to lose you, Stella. Oh. Um, anyway, okay. Any comments before we have a few minutes? I'd love to hear from anyone.
Simon, Deborah, any feedback? Sorry to put you on the spot. But we enjoy those, you know, feedback and then questions and additions. Okay, so uh, I think to to at that point then it's been really an interesting session. Uh, always, you know, it's always a top up. It's always more. It gets even more and more interesting. And as you deeper now, start to do the consolidation. But then, as I always say, remember most of these principles, if anything, they end up feeding up or creating that linkage. You have sort of a web, they link up to, at each and every point, they will keep linking up. Back to you, Steve, and uh, I think we'll call it a day for today. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And 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 <clears throat> with all of your contacts, I'm just seeing your message, Stella. Yeah, just pass on these messages and make people understand now that the second half of the course now, we're going to be turning these, these theories into actions, into designs, and we're going to send a real powerful message out with in that process. So thank you again, everybody, and I will look forward to seeing you all again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. See, See you. See you tomorrow, not next week. <laughs>